Okay, good morning everyone. Good morning. So, grab your Bibles please and turn them to the book of Genesis. I was about to say the book of Exodus. Like, wait, that's the wrong one. Book of Genesis. And we're going to be today in chapter 7. Continue where we left off last time. So, I'm going to keep my comments here at the beginning before we pray. Really short, guys. We've got a ton to cover. It's amazing how much is here. Um, but it's, uh, it's good stuff. So, we are covering uh, chapters 1 through 11 of Genesis in this series called Genesis in the Beginning. And we're hitting the highlights, the major people, the major events, so not going verse by verse necessarily. Um, but we, uh, we've, uh, Genesis, the book of firsts, and all the creation, the first of everything. First man, first woman, first marriage. The first uh, significant choice that had to be made. Will mankind obey and trust God, or will they go their own way? Well, they went their own way, so you had the fall. Very significant. And from there we had the first kids born, the first um, sacrifice made to God. We had the first murder, when Cain killed his brother Abel. Um, and then we had the first mm, chronological uh, lineage, uh, the, uh, the, 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 line, the lines uh, listed out in the end of chapter 4, into chapter 5. The first, uh, first, all of these things. And now we have in this section of Genesis, chapter uh, 6 through 9, and this is covering the history of Noah. So, the history of Noah really is two parts. Chapter 6 and 7 covers the flood. Uh, then chapters 7, uh, I mean, sorry, 8 and 9 covers the aftermath of the flood. In the aftermath of the flood, of course, we had the waters receiving, the receding, the covenant of God uh, that He made with Noah, uh, the start of the repopulation of the earth, and so on, which is what we're going to cover, God willing, next Sunday. We only touched the surface of the flood last week, which is really, today, we're going to be in chapter 7, but we're going to dip a lot into chapter 6 again, because there's a lot of commonalities here, and I'll explain that after we pray. Um, but guys, prepare yourself, because we, we have before us one of the most incredible events, literally, in the history of the world, and we're going to see it with our mind's eye and imagination today. There's so much here, and there's so much to learn from, and it's a picture, what we're about to witness, of the second time God destroys the planet. Only he won't use water the second time. He'll use fire. But with that, let's go before the throne. Let's ask God to teach us, and then we're going to dive right in. So bow with me. But Lord, we just thank you for the book of Genesis and all the things we've seen, all the events, all the people. Uh, we've seen people um, mess up a lot. We've seen people uh, be faithful. We're seeing people now, Noah being faithful to you. But God, no matter what people do, what we need to see is you. Lord, we see your character. We see your judgment and your justice. We also see your mercy, your grace, your compassion. We see it all unfold uniquely in these, in these pages of Genesis. So, God, please, once again, be here. Holy Spirit, this is your pulpit. We just pray, God, that anything that needs to be undone in our thinking, that you do that this morning. Maybe things need to be inserted into our thinking that we've never seen before. But in all of it, God, we just want to see you. We want to know how to respond. We want to be faithful like Noah showed his faithfulness here. And God, just show us uh, also Jesus and how Jesus is the ark. And, and Lord, we want to get on the ark. We want to believe. We want to be ready for the second coming of our Lord. So we just ask you to teach us today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. So, um, we take a, I'm blanking on the name of the thing that goes in the sky, and drone, drone, there we go. So, if we were to take a drone and get a bird's eye view of Genesis chapter 6 and 7, and by the way, remember what I told you last time to begin the message, I said, guys, this is not a fairy tale, this is not allegory, this is not poetry. What we're seeing here in Genesis is reality. This is history. Okay, this is the way it happened. But if we were to sort of, you know, go bird's eye view here of the text, um, what we see here is 
it, really in the whole of Genesis, but especially, I think, here in these chapters, 6, 7, 8, and 9, very simple language is used. So when I did my study of this, there weren't a whole lot of moments where I had to dive into a word and say, what does that word mean? There was a few times. But it's really simple language. But it's simple language that is shared in such detail, such careful, precise detail, and in repetition. Okay, so again, we're going bird's eye view here and kind of looking down at the text. Um, when we start to read chapter 7, we're going to see, we're going to almost feel like there's an echo in the room from chapter 6. Because there's a lot of things that were said at the end of chapter 6 that are going to be repeated, not just once, but several times in chapter 7. And in fact, the same thing is repeated three different times in chapter 7. God just adds a little detail each time he repeats it. So the main verses today are going to be verses 1 through 5 because they really say most of what needs to be said. And then we'll pick and choose of some of the other verses that God leads us to in the rest of the chapter because he fills in, fills in some detail. But here's the thing. When I study, I always ask the question, why? And that's a good question to ask. And I don't mean why as in, well, why did this happen, God? And question is motive. I mean, why did you repeat things three times? There's, there's got to be a reason. He doesn't just do stuff. I mean, his word is perfect. It's inerrant. So there's a reason. So God, why was it that you had to repeat the same things so many times, chapter 6 and then chapter 7? I will tell you that it makes my job a lot easier because, again, I can just look at the, those first five verses and, and then look at the details. And so, but that's not really the reason why God did that, not to make my job easier. I think the reason why God repeated himself over and over again is that he wants to make absolutely certain that there is an unmistakable historical record of God's judgment. And here's why. Because as we read this today, and especially these days that we live in, God wants us to see with absolute clarity how he feels and ultimately how he will deal with sin. He repeats these verses over and over again, guys, because he wants us to see how he feels about sin and how he will ultimately deal with sin. I've, you know, many pastors have preached a message about this uh, chapter, about this section of Genesis. There's other, lots of other moments of the scriptures where you see God's judgment on display. And we live in a society that doesn't like discipline. We live in a society that, society that doesn't like judgment. We, you know, when you make man the center of everything, then mankind's feelings and our wants and desires, all that stuff kind of becomes the centerpiece. The more we push God away, the more we just really don't care about what he thinks about stuff. And that's the society we live in. But when we look at things incorrectly like this, and many pastor and many teacher, many, many preacher, try to sort of soften the blow when God's ju judgment shows up. And guys, this is God's judgment upon the earth, upon mankind. And so lots of guys and gals, are, they try to soften it. And they try to sort of apologize for God. Oh, the book of Genesis, you know, it's, it's allegory, it's poetry. It, God just, he's just getting something off his chest, and he's, this is allegorizing it, and so he really didn't mean it, it really didn't happen like this. Oh, yes, it did. And beloved, let me just say this. God Almighty does not need us to apologize for him. Here's the fact. God hates sin. And his wrath is against sin. I told you last week, we've got to stop sharing a false gospel that says, hey, you're great. You're great. You're just fine as you are. Just add Jesus like he's some holy spice. Just add him to your life and you're good already, but he'll make you better. That is a false gospel. Remember what we saw last week in uh, chapter 6 and verse 5? The Lord saw the wickedness, the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. And guys, 
mankind, we need to understand, is desperately wicked in his heart and by his nature. We are children of wrath, and therefore we are in desperate need of a Savior. And I want to say right up the front, the ark is a picture of Jesus. The ark is a picture of Jesus. Um, the gospel is once again presented in the flood, where billions of people rejected him, but this remnant of eight loved him, had faith in God, believed in him, and they were on that ark. That's the picture of Christ. Billions of people reject him, but there's a small group who got in that ark. And more, of that, more about that later. So, God cares way too much for us to lie to us and tell us that we're okay without salvation. Um, and let me say this too, before we read verse 1 of chapter 7. I, I, I read a lot of commentaries and, uh, over the last several weeks, and I remember one of the, I think it might have been one of the, um, the messages I, I heard, but the, whoever it was said, God is not an environmentalist. And I thought about that and went, man, that's a great statement. Um, do you know the moment that sin entered into mankind and then therefore creation, do you, do you realize that that's the moment that the earth became disposable, a disposable planet? And um, in the first flood, he destroyed the earth, but he didn't wipe away the earth altogether. He just destroyed it. And the second time, he's going to destroy the earth, but then he's going to throw the earth away and replace it with a new earth. So this planet that we live on is a disposable planet. Now that doesn't mean that God doesn't want us to be good stewards of this planet. He gave us this planet and he does want us to be good stewards of it. But my point is, is that environmentalism is not God's main concern. Um, God is not, his main concern isn't the physical world. You know what his main concern is? First of all, it's his own righteousness. But next to that is his concern is our spiritual condition without him. That's his concern. And if God has to destroy an entire planet to make that point, he's going to do it. And so that's what we see here in Genesis chapter 7. So with that, look with me now, Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. Now let me stop there. And let me remind you of a couple things. You remember back in chapter 6, um, in verse 3, God said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be, and he means from this moment on, 120 years. He says also in verse 13, God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come to before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, because of their sin, and behold, I am about to destroy them along with the earth. So here's the thing we need to remember. With the, the moment there in chapter 6, when God said, Noah, here's what's going to go down. My hatred for sin is such that I'm going to destroy mankind, destroy this earth. That's when the gun sounded, so to speak, and they had 120 years. So it was 120 years when God said he's going to do this. Now in chapter 7 and verse 1, 120 years has passed. Now let me remind you of something. This 120 years thing is absolutely God's grace and mercy. Because when God said, I cannot abide mankind anymore. In fact, I regret that I made him. I'm going to wipe him away along with the planet he lives on. He could have literally done it instantaneously. He could have brought some kind of plague or a fire or whatever he wanted to do. He could have said, we're done now. But instead, what did God choose to do? He said, no, 120 years. Now, I realize that it takes 120 years to build an ark. I mean, obviously. But that's not the ultimate reason why God did that. And I just want to say, yes, God's wrath is against sin. Equal to his hatred for sin, guys, is also his mercy and compassion and grace for us. And that was an absolutely gracious thing for him to do. And there's something else I'd like to add to that. In this period of 120 years that God gave mankind, this was, no doubt about it, 
the opportunity for the, the place, you know, the planet, those who had not turned, and remember, it's only eight that had repented, only eight who believed. That means you have between 750 million to, say, 7 billion people that populated the planet at the time. Let's say billions of people. So billions of people rejected God, and only eight people believed in Him. That's an astonishing ratio. He gave those billions of people 120 years to repent and seek Him and His forgiveness. And you know how we know that? Well, I'll tell you. <clears throat> um, first of all, chapter 6, verse 8. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 9. Noah was blameless and walked with God. We know that Noah believed in God and loved God. But there's something else about Noah that we need to know. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, make note of that. 2 Peter 2 and verse 5, it tells us that God preserved Noah, along with seven others, it says, and that means his family, right? His wife, their sons, and their sons' wives. But Noah, God preserved Noah, and he calls Noah, quote, a preacher of righteousness. Did you know that Noah was a preacher? He was a preacher of righteousness. So, First of all, Noah was absolutely obedient to God. I, I love this. You, you notice that at the end of chapter 6, well, really all of chapter 6, but at the end of chapter 6, God gives Noah these great details about how big the boat's going to be. Well, it's not really a boat. It's basically just a, a, a rectangle. Okay, it's not, a, it's not a boat. There's no navigation equipment on this thing. It's just literally a box or a rectangle. But he told him very specifically, here's what you do. Boom, 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 boom. And then at the end of chapter 6, thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. So basically, Noah said, I mean, sorry, God said to Noah, build an ark. There's no record of anything else said until verse seven, or chapter 7, verse 1, when Noah was told by God, now get in the ark. Build an ark, Noah. Yes, Lord. Get in the ark, Noah. Yes, Lord. Nothing else was said in between. And Noah didn't quibble with God, didn't ask for more data from God, didn't say, you know, I, just, I don't even know what rain is, so can you explain the concept of rain to me? What's that about? None of that. We know uh, Noah was obedient because, not by his words, in fact, Noah didn't really say anything. He just does it. And that's the purest form of obedience, is it not? Not the lip service. Not the, oh yes, I'll obey, yes Lord, yes Lord, and then we do something different with our lives. No, it's just, he heard the Lord, he said in his heart, got it, and he did it. But Noah was also a preacher of righteousness. So, with all my heart, I believe that as the neighbors are looking at what Noah and his family are doing, hey Noah... Why are you building this big thing and wasting all of your time and money? Noah was telling them, well, a flood is coming. God told me a flood is coming. It's going to rain. Well, what's rain? <laughs> Noah was telling them, repent because God is going to destroy you. Repent, because God, this planet that you're living on now, will one day be a distant memory. And so, that is God's doing, guys, that He's put a preacher, and His pulpit was the ark. And He's telling people to repent, because judgment's coming. You know, let me just push pause for a second here. Noah is us. You realize that? Not just guys like me who preach from a pulpit. We are ministers of the gospel, guys. We deliver the gospel to people. Guys, there's going to be another judgment soon. Jesus is going to return. And He's going to gather His people. But He's going to bring judgment on the place, the planet that of the people, the billions of people who reject Him. That day is coming. 
what are we doing in the meantime? First of all, are we just being obedient with our mouths? Or are we being obedient with our hearts and our lives? That's a good question. But secondly, are we preaching the right gospel? Are we preaching repentance? Are we telling people, you've got to get on the ark? You've got to believe in Jesus. But don't, mis don't re forget the mercy and grace of God in giving them 120 years to repent. Now, nobody did. Nobody else repented. And, and that, that didn't stop Noah from preaching. But the fact is, nobody repented. Um, Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 38, the end of, you know, when he comes back, it's going to be just like the days of Noah. So Jesus puts the stamp of this is absolutely what happened. This is history. But he says what's going to be happening is people are going to be living and, you know, and eating and drinking and giving each other in marriage. And then all of a sudden, judgment. Now again, uh, God told Noah, build an ark. Now he says in, in chapter 7, verse 1, get in the ark, you and your, your family. It's a great act of faith that Noah displayed. Um, and now, but, but let me say this before we get to the creatures. Um, Noah's, this was a great act of faith on Noah's part, and it literally was God speaking to Noah and Noah believing him. So there was no other thing needed for Noah to believe God but the word of God. You notice that? He had his word, and Noah obeyed his word. Okay? So that's, that's why in Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 7, the, the, the hall of fame of faith, and you have all these Old Testament brothers and sisters in there, Noah is in verse 7, Hebrews 11, 7, because it says God counted Noah's actions as a result of his faith and trust in God. Okay. So here's what I want to do now. I want us to talk about, this is uh, kind of the stuff that people are curious about when it comes to the, the flood and the ark and so forth. Let's talk about the creatures in the ark because that's what the passage does next. Okay, so if you're taking notes, there's, there's really no points that are coming out. We're just looking at the narrative and sort of making observations. But you can put in your notes, the creatures on the ark. And here's some, some stuff that uh, you probably want to know. Now, go back with me for a second to chapter 6 and look at verses 19 and 20. Okay, Genesis 6, 19 and 20. It says, of every living thing of all flesh... Noah, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. But then in verse 20, of the birds after their kind and of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind, here it is, two of every kind shall come to you to keep them alive. So God is telling them, first of all, no, Noah, you don't have to go across the known world and gather all these animals and, you know, make them follow you to the ark. No, I'm going to do that for you. But when I bring them to you, you take them and you put them, you, you know, direct them to the inside the ark. God's the one who brought the animals. Okay. Look now at verses 2 and 3 of chapter 7. He says the same thing, but he elaborates. There's more details given. So in chapter 7, verse 2, You shall take with you of every clean animal by sevens, a male and his female, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and a female. Verse 3, Also of the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. The goal here of the animals was to preserve the gene pool of every species of animal. But you notice he throws this sevens thing in there, right? So there's two by two, but wait a minute. Now he says sevens. So here's what he's doing. What God is saying is, and this has everything to do with this clean and unclean animal thing. This is the first, remember the Genesis is the book of firsts. This is the first time in the Bible that clean and unclean animals are mentioned. Okay? What God is telling Noah is, there are going to be of the unclean animals, just two, a male and a female. But of the clean animals, there's going to be seven pairs of them. Male, female, seven times. Everybody with me? 
Seven pairs. Okay. Again, he's elaborating. This is, this is more details. It's more details than we're given in chapter 6. So why, why in the world is this, what's this clean and unclean thing all about? Okay. You know there's other places in the Bible that talk about it, like Exodus talks a little bit about it, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. They talk about the clean and the unclean animals. What is behind all of the clean and unclean animal thing? Sacrifices. Right? Animal sacrifice. And really, it's not animal sacrifice so much as blood sacrifice. And God uses animals, not people. So, with the clean and unclean, what he's saying is, of the sacrificable, the animals eligible to be sacrificed unto the Lord in worship, you need more than two. You need seven pairs. Because two of those are going to keep the gene, the gene pool alive in that species. But what are the other ones for? Sacrifice. They're clean. They're eligible to be sacrificed. The unclean animals, we're not sacrificing them. So you just need two to preserve the gene pool. Everybody with me? Guys, the sacrificial system was already in place before the flood. We know that because Cain and Abel made a sacrifice. And Cain killed Abel because there was a righteous sacrifice that his brother did, and his was unrighteous, so he got jealous and killed him. Not a good response. But um, next week we're going to see the post-flooding stuff. After the waters, after years of, you know, of the waters receding, and finally they can get off the boat, Noah and his family, what's one of the first things that they did? They sacrificed to the Lord. They needed these extra animals, guys, because if they, had, if they only had two of the clean ones and they killed them, well, that, that species is extinct instantly. So that's what all that's about. Everybody with me? By the way, um, it's not two of every kind as in two of every type of animal. So let's just use a dog, the dog species for a moment. It doesn't mean two of every dachshund, two of every German Shepherd, two of every Great Dane, and so forth, okay? It's two of every animal species. Because, and, and we know this just even from humanity, it, it was two people, and then now we have eight people, and the whole earth is populated, and we have different races and so forth. So it just takes two to preserve the gene pool, and, and all the variants of that come as a result of what you know, happens genetically. So it's just two dogs, not 52 pair. Okay, and I'm just using that as an example. I know, you're disappointed. I got gotcha. you. Um, God preserved on that ark, He preserved every, all the genetic material necessary to produce all of the animals that ever lived after the flood. Some of those animals are extinct today, but he preserved them in the ark. The question always comes up, what about dinosaurs? Were dinosaurs on the ark? The answer is, yes. They absolutely were. So let me explain that. I'll try. Okay, <clears throat> how do I go about this? Um, there's a fairy tale that accidentally there was a big bang. And somehow in that big bang, that happened, nobody knows why, it just happened. That life was formed, and somehow on this planet, plasma, goo, whatever, uh, did its thing, and then billions of years go by, and now you have uh, dinosaurs. And they rule the earth for however millions of years they rule the earth. And then a comet hits the earth, and it destroys the whole earth. Oh, by the way, scientists believe that the earth was destroyed. They just don't say it's a flood. Although, lots of secular scientists are even saying that it had to be a flood. Okay? But I'm following the line of thinking here that you learned in school. Am I not? So the dinosaurs were hit, and so after millions of years they're on the earth, the, they're destroyed because of this comet. And then somehow, goo did its thing again and evolved into monkeys and apes, and then that's where we got man. That's a fairy tale, guys. All of that's a fairy tale. How did it happen? 
it says in the Bible how it happened. God spoke, everything was created. He, pres he created man out of dirt. He created woman out of dirt's rib. And then away we go. And he, he created all the animals and all the vegetation and all that stuff. That's the story. That's the history. Guys, what are dinosaurs? They're reptiles. That's what they are. They're, rip they're reptiles. Reptiles were created by God pre-flood. We know that because there's a snake, right? That's a reptile. Now here's what, something that you need to know. Reptiles, I think, are the only species like this, but if not the only, they're one of the only species that grows as long as they live. They call it indeterminate growth. Now not all reptiles do this, but most do. So you have a lizard this big, if that lizard lives 50 years, it keeps growing all of those 50 years. You ever see those uh, kimono dragons? They weren't born that size, guys. <laughs> they grew to that size. Now, we're going to talk about more uh, when we get to, in just a few minutes, the actual flood itself, about the canopy around the, the earth. That canopy, though, it stopped the ultraviolet radiation from the sun getting in as much. This is why people and all living creatures lived longer than we live now. Remember, humans were living six, seven, eight, even 900 years plus. Well, that wasn't just humans that lived that long. All the living creatures lived that long. So if a reptile grows as long as it lives, what if the reptile lives to be 300 years? You know what you're going to have? A pretty big lizard. And guess what that is? A dinosaur. You with me? So, were dinosaurs on the ark? Yeah, because lizards were on the ark. Reptiles were on the ark. And I don't think... Now, the ark could handle it because this thing was a football field and a half long. And then 75 feet wide, it's a big boat, or a big, really not a boat, but a big, you know, rectangle, three stories tall. So if God chose to bring, you know, full-size dinosaurs on board, it could have happened. It could have fit it. However, I don't think this would happen. I think God probably brought younger uh, samples of the species. So you have the post-flood, and it takes a little bit, but... Creatures aren't living that long because that canopy's gone and ultraviolet radiation's getting in. So lizards and reptiles aren't living as long. So the lizards aren't growing to be dinosaur size. Are you with me? That explains it, doesn't it? Dinosaurs are reptiles, guys, and reptiles were on the ark. Okay. Now let's transition to the actual flood. And I've only got 12 minutes to do it, but let's do it. The actual flood. Everybody look with me now in uh, verse 4. God said this, For after seven more days, I will send rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and I will blot out from the face of the, the land every living thing that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. There's that repetition. Verse 6, now Noah was 600 years old when the flood of water came upon the earth. So that's a new detail shared. Noah was 600 years old when the flood hit. He lived another 350 years after the flood, so he lived a total of 950 years. Okay. You notice that God said here, get on the ark. So Noah got on the ark, and the animals were on the ark. And God said, I'm going to wait a week. you got seven days. So there's seven more days. To, again, it's 120 total by the time God said, here's the sentence, and the flood came. But in this time period, there's that week where Noah is on the ark, and I bet you Noah is still preaching it because the door's not shut yet. So I, I see Noah in the doorway of this huge, you know, this huge thing, and he's still preaching repentance. It doesn't say he's doing that, but I just I see that in my mind's eye. Okay, look at verse 10. Um, it came about after the seven days that the water of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, and on the same day, all the fountain of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky 
were open. And the rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Okay. Now, um, guys, let me show you something here. Before the flood, in the original creation, there was no such thing as rain. Before the flood, in the original creation, hydrology, right, the study of how the, the earth gets watered, there was no such thing as rain. Um, if you look back at chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, it says this, Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet ha uh, sprouted. By the way, that shrub and plant, that's talking about weeds. Vegetation was different. God created that. He watered that. And I'll show you how in a minute. But it says no weeds had yet shown up on the, the horizon there, the field. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth. And there was no man to cultivate the ground. Verse 6. But a mist used, uh, used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. So it's totally different. It's backwards of how God watered the earth. He didn't use rain falling from the sky. He used water coming out of the bottom of the ground. Um, it's, you, can, you can call this a, 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 um, a fountain, a spring, a flow, but the water came from under. The water gushed from the ground. It didn't come from the top. Um, so even though sin had, sin had entered the world in chapter 3, that didn't change the way the, the eco-structure was in place. That still remained. The way God watered stuff was, was still the same. You understand? So even now up to the days of Noah, that's what was going on. You had water underneath. Um, now God says, it's going to rain. And in order for there to be rain, that means that something incredible had to happen on the earth. And here's what it says in verse uh, 11. It says that the fountains of the deep, that flow of the deep burst open, and the floodgates of the sky were now open. By the way, the word uh, for... Um, Rain in verse 12 is Geshem, and it means torrential rain. So when God said it's going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights, he's not talking about a slight sprinkle. He's talking about torrential rain, solid torrential rain for 40 days and 40 nights. Flooding happened so bad that it says in verse 19, all the high mountains everywhere on the earth at that time were underwater. So let me boil it down to you or don't boil it down for you. Two things happened to cause the earth to flood that way. Number one, God opened up the ground. Okay? He opened up the ground. That spring flow that gushed from the ground, that fountain of the great deep, it literally burst open. So the crust of the earth, all over the earth, opened up and unleashes this reservoir of water and you have to see it came out with such force tons of energy came out of the ground it's coming out with heat and steam and it's rising and as it blows up you've got trees flying in the air and shrapnel you know like not shrapnel shrapnel but like uh, you know debris and land it's all going crack you know just boom right in the, in the in, in, uh, into the sky this was not just a, a slight, you know, everything's kind of coming up real gingerly. No. This is power, energy, volcanic-like scene. What happened was, all of that stuff that's flying in the air went high enough to where now, the second thing is, God poked a hole in the sky. And at that time, according to chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, water was above the expanse or the atmosphere. So what scholars presume is that there's this canopy of water around the earth. Or around the earth. Okay? So you have the sky and then water. That would make sense because 
again, that would slow down the radiation coming from the sun that wouldn't get on living creatures, and they would live longer. You see? Well, what happened was God poked a hole in that canopy, and the rain in that canopy came flooding down for 40 days and 40 nights. So you've got water coming from the ground in this just incredible way. You've got water now torrentially coming out of the sky. Oh, they knew what rain is now. Just try to imagine this. <laughs> just put yourself, put your imagination into what's going on here. These masses of steam and water and land masses exploding into the sky. So much so they're ripping the canopy apart. You know, guys, the landscape of the earth, the entire earth, was no longer the same. It changed completely, permanently. You have new mountains that rose. You had forests that were wiped away. You had new continents. Continents sank and rose again, you know, just with all the sheer energy. You had ice caps being created. You had stratification that produced things like the Grand Canyon. And we're seeing all this destruction in our mind's eye. And here's how I'm going to close the message. We're seeing all of this in our imaginations. And guys, we have to remember something. God did that. It was God who made the earth un underneath open up. It was God who made the sky open up. This is God's doing. Over and over again, He says, I will bring the flood. I will blot out everything that I've made. This is God's judge justice. This is God's judgment for the incredible wickedness that was in man's hearts. And here he is, judging with this tremendous flood. And I know that people don't like this. I know people don't like to, to think of God and his judgment. And I think it's because we really don't understand sin. I think mankind just doesn't have a handle on its, his own sin our own sin. But guys, look at this verse. This is how I'll close. Look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. Those that entered, male and female, and of all flesh, entered as God had commanded him. So God commanded Noah, his family, and all his animals. God did that. But look at this. And the Lord closed the door behind him. We're talking about a massive door. They couldn't have closed it themselves. It was a miracle. Literally, this door that probably acted in some way as a ramp, huge door, God shut it. A miracle. When that door was shut, the world that Noah and his family knew would never be seen again. Soon, the whole world would have been below them underwater. And here's a family floating on this, this, you know, it's a floating zoo. It's just a gigantic rectangle. And they're, th this family aboard, they're living in the hope of a better world and a new life, of newness of life. Doesn't that describe us? That we hope for a better world that someday God's going to give us? And we hope for that newness of life. Let me read you something from 1 Peter chapter 3. It's not just how we see it, guys. It's how the apostles see it. It's how God sees it. 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 20. Listen to these words. When the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight people, Noah and his family, were brought safely through the water. Verse 21. Corresponding to that. So he's saying, just like we see, Noah getting in the boat, and he and his family, and being spared and saved. Corresponding to that. Baptism now saves you. And he's not talking about water baptism, because the next thing he says is, not the removal of dirt from the flesh. Not baptism, that is, by water. No. But... He says, an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gospel. When we repent and turn to Christ, we are baptized in Christ. Inextricably baptized into His Spirit. What Peter is saying there is, the ark is the picture of Jesus. And guys, when we believe in Christ... 
when we trust in Him, believe on Him in faith, we literally rise above the judgment waters. And beloved, listen, all of this that we looked at today, it's a foreshadowing of the judgment to come, only it's not with water. But you know what? God's going to do something underground and above when He brings fire to the earth. What's underground right now under the earth? What's fiery underneath there? Lava. Volcan hundreds of volcanoes, volcanoes all over the earth. What's, what's in the sky that has such um, heat and radiant radiation power and heat? What is that? It's the sun. He's going to use both of those things and many more things to judge the earth and destroy it and, and judge the hearts of man again. But as I close, those of you who are listening and you have not given your life to Jesus, do you see Noah? Do you see him standing in the doorway of that ark? And do you hear him asking you to repent? See, one day he's going to return. And he's going to take his people with him. And those who are left who did not repent. You know, the Bible tells us that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, that is, you confess He is God, and you believe in your heart that Jesus rose from the dead, that is, you believe that He died for your sin but rose from death three days later, it says you will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from God's judgment and wrath. So here's my question. Are you on the ark or not? Are you on the ark or not? Will you believe in Jesus or not? Let's pray. Well, Lord, we went through a lot of information in a short period of time. God, I just thank you for that. I thank you that, you know, these sort of these insights and these lessons learned. But God, we do ask that you would help us. First of all, those of us who have believed, who, who did get on the ark, God, I pray for us. I pray... Lord, that we'd stand faithful. We'd stay and remain faithful to you. We'd walk with you, God. We wouldn't give up. We wouldn't, you know, we hear your word and we'd obey. And Lord, we would minister. We would preach the gospel. We would be preachers of righteousness into this culture. Regardless of whether or not people repent, we would do what we're called to do, to shine and share the glory of, of Christ. But Lord, I pray for those who are not on the ark. And I pray, Lord, that today, right now, they'd hear the voice of Jesus. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Turn, believe. Lord, I pray that people would believe and get on the ark. And Lord, we, we thank you that you are going to judge the world again because we see the wickedness. It's, it's more and more just like the days of Noah. And so we thank you, Lord, that you are returning for us. You're returning for your people. And we thank you for your justice and your judgment as well. We know, Lord, you hate sin, but you offer mercy and grace. So thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.